Muy buenos días. A, a, soy Rafael Fernández de Castro. Soy el director del Centro de Estudios México-Estados Unidos de la Universidad de California, San Diego. Y me da mucho gusto dar la bienvenida a todos ustedes a este webinar sobre la crisis del fentanilo y cómo es que los candidatos republicanos están haciendo de México el país enemigo. Eh, para eso tenemos un panel de lujo. Esto lo organizamos con el Consejo Mexicano de Asuntos Internacionales. Y me da mucho gusto dar la bienvenida a Nathan Wolf, el nuevo director eh, del de Comexi. Ahora no nos puede acompañar Sergio Alcocer, pero estará en su lugar Nathan Wolf. Bienvenido, Nathan. Antes de pasarle la palabra a Nathan para que presente a nuestros panelistas, let me tell you that this is going to be a, a fully bilingual uh, webinar and that we will have simultaneous translation. Uh, let me give the floor to Carmen uh, Chavez, who will be our translator, so he could explain to you how you could listen to this webinar either in English or in Spanish. Carmen, please go ahead and, and explain what, what is what we have to do. Uh, thank you. We are offering live interpretation in Spanish during this meeting. And if you wish to hear Spanish interpretation, please click on the interpretation button on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom screen. There's a globe icon. Estamos ofreciendo interpretación en vivo en español durante esta reunión. Si desea escuchar la interpretación en español, haga clic en el botón de interpretación en la parte inferior a mano derecha de la pantalla de Zoom. Muchas gracias, Carmen. Uh, Nathan, yours is the floor so you could introduce the panelists. Thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you to all of you. And let me introduce this great panel. Ana Maria Salazar, periodista, analista, experta en seguridad en relaciones entre Estados Unidos y América Latina. Ha trabajado en varios países de América Latina, autora de cinco libros y conferencista eh, de manera habitual. Eh, ocupó cargos en el Departamento de Defensa de Estados Unidos y la Casa Blanca, siendo subsecretaria adjunta de defensa en el Departamento de Defensa de los Estados Unidos. David Shriek, catedrático en la Universidad de San Diego y UCSD, especialista en política mexicana, relaciones Estados Unidos-México y seguridad fronteriza, director de justicia en México, proyecto de investigación sobre justicia penal en México, ha trabajado como consultor para organizaciones internacionales, ha recibido múltiples becas y ha sido fellow en, en prestigiosas instituciones, fue director del Instituto Transfronterizo del UCSD y del Programa de Maestría en Relaciones Internacionales. José Cárdenas, consultor con más de 35 años de experiencia en política de Washington y relaciones interamericanas, ha ocupado altos cargos en el Departamento de Estado de Estados Unidos, el Consejo de Seguridad Nacional y la Agencia de Estados Unidos para el Desarrollo. Fue asesor principal del secretario general de la OEA y miembro del personal de la Comisión de Relaciones Exteriores del Senado de los Estados Unidos, asesor de la Fundación para los Derechos Humanos en Cuba y miembro del Consejo de Investigación del Centro para una Cuba Libre, coordinador de cursos en el Instituto del Servicio Exterior del Departamento de Estado de los Estados Unidos y participante en el programa de oradores extranjeros del Departamento de Estado. Bienvenidos a todos. Gracias, Nathan. Eh... Tenemos un panel de lujo y déjenme eh, eh, comenzar así. Ya hemos tenido este tipo de crisis en que Estados Unidos en los ochentas, por ejemplo, cuando, cuando había este problema de la, de, del, del crack, cocaína en los Estados Unidos, hubo una crisis muy fuerte con México cuando el asunto Camarena en 1985, pero soy de la idea que nunca había habido una crisis tan profunda de drogadicción de adicciones, eh, de tanta gente que se muere diga, eh, en los Estados Unidos. Entonces, ¿por qué no empezamos por eso, David? O sea, ¿qué tan profunda es la crisis de, de los opioides en Estados Unidos? Por cierto, les recomiendo a todos ustedes, si no han visto la serie de Netflix, eh, el Painkiller, hay que verla. Explica muy bien cómo arranca este problema en los Estados Unidos de, de la gran crisis de, así, de mortandad de los opioides. Entonces, le doy la palabra a mi amigo y vecino y colega eh, de aquí de San Diego, David Schirk. Adelante, David, please. Bueno, muchísimas gracias antes que, antes que nada a, a Rafael y al centro por convocar esta importante conversación sobre si un, un tema de altísima importancia en la política de, de ambos países. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll 
I'll try to stick to Spanish, but uh, thank you for, for having me and for, con uh, for convening this very important discussion. I would like to, um, I'm just gonna see if I can share here uh, for a moment. And I wanna draw attention to sort of the, the scope of the problem that we're having and uh, just give some, some basic numbers that most of us are probably familiar with. And forgive me one moment. Are you able to see this okay? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Now, what we know, uh, uh, most of us who are following this uh, issue closely understand very well, is that we've seen a dramatic change. Hemos visto un cambio dramático. In, uh, hemos visto un cambio dramático en, en, el, en oh. la cantidad de uh, oh. muertes en Estados Unidos uh, relacionados a las drogas. Y una gran proporción, a, a great uh, a great proportion of the number of drug overdose deaths that we have seen in the last few years, which has been growing, uh, have to do with synthetic opioids, particularly fentanyl. Los opioides sintéticos, especialmente el fentanilo, se han convertido en, en uh, un, uh, una fuente importante uh, de muertes uh, de sobredosis en Estados Unidos. It is the number one killer of uh, young people in America today. Es, el, es la, la causa principal de las muertes uh, de los jóvenes en Estados Unidos en, en este momento. Um, and, and what has happened is there's been a, a, a sea change in drug consumption in the United States because of the rise of synthetic opioids, um, partly related to medical prescription of opioids in the United States over the last 10, 15 years, um, but also partly because of the provision of illicit synthetic opioids. Este, este fenómeno en parte se debe al crecimiento de las prescripciones de los opioides sintéticos en Estados Unidos por razones médicas, a veces sin eh, las precauciones necesarias y uh, segundo por el, el incremento del uso o de, 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 de la disponibilidad de opioides sintéticos ilícitos y fentanilo es una parte importante de la explicación porque fentanilo es una sustancia eh, ilícita y uh, uh, bueno, es una sustancia lícita y ilícita. O sea, uh, se puede pres prescribir um, en, uh, eh, para uso médico, pero también se puede manufacturar para uh, 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 um, la distribución ilícita de manera muy barata y muy fácil. Um, we know that fentanyl is used both for medical purposes, but also illicit, for illicit purposes, in part because it is a very... Um, cheap substance to produce. It is a relatively easy substance to produce, provided you can get the, um, the precursor chemicals that are needed. Um, la, la gran mayoría de, lo, de los químicos pre, de, uh, necesarios para la manufactura de fentanilo uh, provienen de Asia. Um, est están prohibido, está prohibido pro, uh, uh, manufacturar ciertos químicos para el uso, eh, la manufactura de fentanilo en Estados Unidos y en México. Y por eso la importación de estos químicos viene uh, primariamente de Asia. Uh, es pro, está prohibido también en China, pero eh, hemos visto grandes cantidad, cantidades que vienen de China. So the supply chain here really goes from China uh, into uh, Mexico uh, and the United States. Um, is particularly for illicit production of, uh, of fentanyl, uh, which involves the use of some precursor chemicals that have been prohibited in, uh, in, other, in the United States and in Mexico and even in China. But unfortunately, uh, illicit actors are moving this substance into the United States. Now, what's super interesting to me is, you know, over the, over the last decade or so, we've seen a dramatic decline in, for example, uh, the, imp the illegal import of cannabis. Uh, hemos visto una, un declive sustantivo de la, uh, la importación de la marihuana ilícita, por ejemplo. Um, y, y, incluso en años recientes hemos visto una, uh, un declive en la cantidad de heroína importada eh, en términos de tonelaje de, de, de heroína uh, uh, encontrado por el gobierno mexicano y también eh, encontrado por el gobierno estadounidense. We're, we're seeing a drop in 
uh, heroin, for example, imported into the United States at the same time that we're seeing this dramatic increase or these dramatic increases in fentanyl. And, and so, um, and of course we're seeing, you don't need a lot of fentanyl. Fentanyl, one of the advantages of fentanyl is it's a very, very powerful drug. So we're seeing very, uh, what would be considered small amounts in comparison to marijuana or heroin of fentanyl moving into the country. Um, but it's in sufficient quantities to uh, cause very significant um, uh, amounts of, of overdoses. And part of that has to do with the fact that heroin, uh, or I should say the, pure, uh, the purity levels of fentanyl, um, or the, I should say the, the dosage levels of fentanyl um, are often very irregular. A very small amount of fentanyl can cause a, a, a person to overdose. Uh, and so the doses have to be extremely small when they're put into uh, pills and other substances that people are using to get fentanyl. But if you get a dose that hasn't been properly measured, it will kill you. And so part of the problem is quality control. But uh, the reality is we're seeing larger and larger amounts of fentanyl used as an additive uh, to drugs that people are consuming in the United States. And I'll, I'm, I'm almost finished. So I'll just point out that most of this is uh, most of the fentanyl that's entering the United States is coming through the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, the Mexican government has uh, asserted that Me Mexico is not a source of fentanyl for the United States, um, but we are certainly finding it uh, coming across the border from Mexico. Uh, and we're finding it especially in places like Arizona and California. And so um, th there are things that maybe we could do to concentrate our efforts uh, to, to better address the phenomenon. Uh, but that's a quick summary. What we know basically is that over the last year, you know, 100,000 uh, Americans have died as a result of uh, overdoses, many of them related to fentanyl. Now, interestingly, that's proportionate to, it's about three times as many Mexicans has died last year due to homicide. So our countries have a shared stake in trying to solve this problem. Um, Many, many Mexicans are dying because of violence related to the drug trade. Many, many Americans are dying because of overdoses related to the drug trade. And as, as Rafael said, there's no problem that the United States and Mexico can't solve if we put our minds to it and work together. So hopefully this discussion will help make that happen. Thank you, David. This is a wonderful overview. And uh, let me remind all of you listening and watching this webinar, there's a Q&A bottom. Un Botón allá abajo de preguntas y respuestas. Úsenlo. We would like to do, to make this uh, webinar as interactive as possible. We're ready to answer your questions. Now let me give the floor to Ana María Salazar and, and eventually to José Cárdenas. Ana María, how does this uh, opioid crisis translate into politics? I mean, you you have worked in national security in the U.S. But have you seen uh, this uh, narrative coming out of the Republicans? I, I mean. I mean Help us to explain how come Republicans have become, I mean, Mexico is not only become the, becoming the political piñata of Republicans, but it's really becoming the enemy. So uh, help us, Ana Maria, to understand this crisis. And, and Nathan, uh, take a look at the questions because very soon you, uh, I will ask you to, 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 to just feed yes. uh, the panelists with the questions from our public. Ana no. Maria, por, uh, por favor. You know, that's, that's a really good question because I was trying to compare the cocaine wars with the fentanyl wars. I think we can start calling this a fentanyl war because of the rhetoric that's being used and the difficulties that I would say both countries are having to, to confront this, uh, this crisis because it is, we have to be really clear, it is, it's a health crisis, it's a national security crisis when you look at it from um, Mexico's uh, perspective in terms of the territorial control that these criminal organizations have over vast parts of, of, of Mexico. And it's also a, um, it's a diplomatic uh, crisis. Um, so when you think of what, how the United States and Mexico were able to cooperate uh, during very difficult times, including, and you, you, I'm sure you would call this uh, um, the 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 uh, cocaine wars or the cocaine crisis. Um, there's very important differences now than ten year uh, even ten years ago that I think it's very important to underline. And it I think it in part explains why um, 
why Mexico um, and uh, why the reaction of not only Republicans, because I think we need to start to start listening to some of the uh, Democrats who are also starting to express concern about uh, not only this administration's strategy uh, regarding the fentanyl crisis, but um, but in in other in other you know the the immigration crisis. It has to do with Mexico and some of the important changes that have taken place in the United States. And I think one of the most important one has to do with the perception about Mexico. When, um, when Donald Trump came into office, you know, just as a reminder to all, one of his main parts of his platform was that he was gonna build the wall because he was gonna stop migrants coming, um, undocumented people coming into the United States in part because they bring in drugs. I mean, that was kind of part of the big part of his, his position, which was kind of held throughout the, throughout the administration. And there has been, you know, if you read some of the narrations as to how and what happened in the White House and how some of the decisions were being made at the time regarding Mexico and the bilateral relationship, you know, a lot of it was focused, of course, in trying to make sure that the USC, USMCA was passed, but also it was it's interesting to point out that you know this kind of narrative that you read in some of the books that came out uh you know later i mean there had been this idea that we you know we need to send missiles to mexico and you know the advisor there told me oh, you can't do that uh, mr president and trump said well why not nobody's going to know it was us or the fact that they in a conversation between Enrique Peña Nieto and Donald Trump, if you read the transcripts, there, you know, the president's offering, we will send you our army. You need help. You need to do something about this. So I think there has been a kind of a change of perception about Mexico and how uh, how to solve this problem. In the past, when I was in government, uh, Rafael, when you were in government, I mean, there was always a premium on the best way to approach the problems, either migration, uh, organized crime, drug trafficking, climate problems, was to, the, there was an emphasis and a very good understanding that the best way to do this was cooperation. And, um, and there was always bumps up and down, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but at least the, the idea was we need, cooperation is the only way to go. And when you talk to, government officials right now, or even, even you know, analysts, the, the, this idea that they would call, or their, the, this proposal to um, call criminal, these criminal organizations terrorists, or to use the armed forces or special, you know, operators to come in and quote unquote, solve the problem is creating a lot of anxiety because it's literally, it would be a way of shutting down any type of cooperation on anything between both countries, which would be a very, very difficult situation considering the, the size of the border and the issues that need to be addressed. I think also important, so there's a change of perception about Mexico and how to address the problems uh, between both nations, but also very important, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about this, has to do with, um, has to do with the, uh, um, the very important structural reforms that took place in the last five years in the national security and the public security uh, structures in Mexico, by which literally the armed forces, particularly I should say Sedena, the army, are in charge of most of the public security uh, and, um, responsibilities in this country. And the, the reform itself, the restructuring of this has also created a lot of, um, I would say a lot of confusion and of course, a lot of incapacity to go after these organizations. You know, when you do these types of reforms in any country, you know, in the short term, things just don't function very well. I mean, just as a reminder, when they first created Homeland Security, how dysfunctional it was the first couple of, uh, of years. So when you have these massive reforms, it also creates certain dysfunctionality in terms of priorities, interests, resources, uh, command. So some of that is happening. But another aspect that no one has, I, well, very few people have talked about is who's at the table now? Who does, who represents Mexico in terms of its uh, security uh, strategy and its public security strategy? In the past, at, at different points, it used to be State Department on, on behalf of the United States and Relaciones Exteriores on behalf of Mexico. 
it, it then it passed on to Homeland Security, um, and then it was Secretaría de Gobernación, and it, there was quite clear links, you know, of of cooperation or at least discussion in terms of trying to establish priorities. So you didn't have to have, for example, DEA, which is always, you know, creates a lot of friction between in, in these conversations between Mexico and the United States, just because of the history of DEA and, and the role of DEA uh, in, 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 in Mexico. I mean, it's, it's, it's always going, there's always going to be friction. And that's just the nature, the nature of, 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 of these conversations. But now that you also have the fiscal, Fiscal General de la Nación, who used to be the, it is the Attorney General, but it used to be Procurador. The fiscal is in, the, in he's an independent entity now. So he can, he will go to the meeting if he wants to. So he has been not, uh, the Attorney General is not present in many of these high level discussions, or if there is meetings, you know, the meetings is between DOJ, um, uh, DOJ, um, DEA, or DEA. Um, and there are different types of meetings. There isn't that level of cooperation or at least policy cooperation that you had in the past. In the past, there used to be a very special relationship between DOJ and Procuraduría, but that has become even more difficult now because also they need to, they should be coordinating with Sedena, with the National Guard, which is part of the Mexico, it's part of Sedena, the Ministry of, of, of um, of uh, the Ministry of, of the Armed Forces, Ministry of uh, Defense. So there is, I would say right now, there's a certain level of friction just due to the enormous um, changes in Mexico's national security structure. So who is at the table? Who do you coordinate with? So that I think is also another, is another problem. And of course, fentanyl is a very difficult issue to deal with in part because Fentanyl still in Mexico is not perceived as a risk, right? And I know David highlights something that's very important in terms of the violence that these organizations are exercising in Mexico. And of course, as everybody knows, Mexico throughout the decades has begged the United States, has demanded, has screamed and kicked, you have to do something about the arms that are being trafficked into Mexico. And that is not a priority for the United States. It would be very useful for Mexico in terms of being helpful, which is their priority, which is to control violence, but that is not a priority for the United States. So you have two countries with different priorities, with different perceptions of the problem, where the political environment uh, in each country is uh, has changed and cooperation is not perceived as being a priority. And that I think is, is creating a very difficult moment in terms of how to solve the problem. And the Republicans, and, and, and I'm, like I said, I think this is going beyond Republicans now, are trying to figure out ways which they can use this crisis politically, which that's what happens in politics. I mean, this is, that's not a criticism, but at the same time, I mean, there is a demand by, um, by the voters in the United States that something dramatically has to happen to at least try to stop the, the, this crisis, this, this catastrophe of number of people who are dying. And of course, I'm sure many in the, in, in the audience would say, well, you know, the United States deal with your consumption problem. Yes, that is that is a, a huge issue that needs to be dealt with in the United States. But part of the problem also is always going to be perceived as the drugs that are kind of crossing uh, crossing through through the border. So with that, that's that's my my, my first. Thank comment. you, Ana Maria. This is very good. And there's a lot of questions already there. I will ask Nathan to, to start uh, filling up with the questions. But let me go to you, Jose Cardenas. You have worked for quite a few Republican administrations. I mean, uh, do you really think that, uh, I mean, if someone like DeSantis will come to the White House, do you think that he will do something against Mexico, uh, as he has said, his first day in office? I mean, how meaningful you will say is this rhetoric uh, or this ca ca campaign narrative of the Republicans? Are you worried about this, Jose? And if you could try to explain us why are they really seen Mexico as the foe, as the enemy. And thank you, Jose, for joining us. Well, thank you, Rafael. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure uh, and my honor to be here with uh, such distinguished panelists. I think that David and Ana Maria have really uh, nailed some of the most important points of this discussion. And I would like to sort of pick up where 
uh, where they've left off. And, and, and Rafael, I think that what you see, you know, Ana Maria uh, is right. Politics is politics, and people are going to seek a, a particular advantage uh, in the moment. I think broader, broader speaking, there, there, there's a semblance of, of panic uh, in Washington mm -hmm. on, on how to deal with the fentanyl crisis. After all, you know, we've had about 50, 60 years of uh, developed policies and developed strategies uh, amongst the national security establishment and law enforcement in the United States. Uh, all of that has been upended by fentanyl. It's it's not a, a, you know it's not cultivated it's not trafficked in the sense of of uh, of manufactured uh, narcotics it, it, as David mentioned it can be moved very uh, stealthily very small amounts massive profit margins uh, and uh, it has it is introducing an entirely new dynamic to the so-called drug war. And those institutions in the United States are trying to play catch up. And that has created a, a, a level of panic. These, uh, as, as the statistics that David showed uh, demonstrate, uh, these are, this is a, a problem that strikes at the heart of American neighborhoods. And especially uh, as developed during the pandemic, a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty in American society, and has sort of led to a a, a, uh, a search in this sort of uh, uh, drugs that are represented by fentanyl, the opiates, synthetic drugs, things of that nature. So I think that that uh, in one way, there's a lot of panic among uh, politicians in Washington on is the United States uh, adapting in a in a efficient way to mm -hmm. this new problem. The second aspect of this, Rafael, that gets to your point is that unfortunately for the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship, the issue of fentanyl is sort of uh, being subsumed into a, a, a toxic brew of other controversial uh, politi political dynamics in Washington. David mentioned uh, the, uh, the role of Chinese uh, precursor chemicals. So you're throwing in the very uh, 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 tense relationship with China. Uh, you have the role of the cartels that uh, have have also uh, always been a, a, a red button in in, in Washington political uh, uh, discussions. You have the border crisis and the perception in Washington that the cartels in China are taking advantage of the uh, instability at the border to flood more and more of the fentanyl into the United States. And finally, you have uh, the role of President AMLO. And, mm -hmm. you know, just like Donald Trump, he's an unconventional politician. He, he doesn't have much of a filter. And, and people are, you know, uh, always mm -hmm. trying to figure out exactly where AMLO is. Is he committed? as Ana Maria has, has raised. What is his commitment uh, to uh, the partnership on the drug issue? There are always um, questions about uh, the commitment. Yes, under President Calderon, we had this, this mm -hmm. sea change uh, in the relationship to, to counter the, the, the illicit narcotic networks. Uh, where is AMLO on this? Is he, is he committed to working with the United States? So. In terms of U.S. politics, it, 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 it unfortunately has gotten into a, uh, you know, I hate to use the cliche, but a perfect storm that redounds negatively to a stable U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship when, uh, as David mentioned, we have such uh, shared stakes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jose. Nathan, I know there's quite a few questions there. Could you read some one to our panelists? To Rafael, I will read it in the original language. ¿Cómo cambiarán las cosas en materia de seguridad a través de las relaciones bilaterales entre el Palacio Nacional y la Casa Blanca con las inminentes nominaciones de Xochitl Galvez y Claudia Sheinbaum y quien vaya a ser el ocupante de la Casa Blanca en el 2024? Y, y yo te añadiría algo, Ana María. Si tú fueras asesora de Xochitl 
y as o asesora eh, de Claudia, ¿qué tendrían que decir ante esta crisis de fentanilo? Porque además, cuando sea la, la, la primaria republicana, es cuando va a ser la elección federal, es en, en pleno marzo que va a ser el, el Super Tuesday republicano, resulta que va a empezar la campaña muy intensa entre Xochitl y entre Claudia, entonces, ¿qué decir, cómo posicionarse? Ayúdanos, ¿qué les dirías, Ana María? Mira, y, y también yo agregaría que va forzosamente el equipo de Biden y la Casa Blanca van a tener que poner un posicionamiento mucho más contundente y más fuerte de lo que hay en este momento, porque yo creo que parte del problema de, de este proceso, al proceso que estamos a punto de entrar, es que eh, se percibe que el presidente Joe Biden, primero, que no es una prioridad. Dos, que el presidente y la Casa Blanca y el mismo Departamento de Estado han sido, en cierta forma, no han sido críticos o abiertamente no han presionado, públicamente no han presionado al, a, al presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador y a su equipo eh, en, este, en este tema. De hecho, ayer hubo unas declaraciones, hubo una audiencia eh, en donde declararon eh, en el Senado, en donde hubo declaraciones muy interesantes, por ejemplo, hubo uno de los funcionarios dijo pues que están un poco desesperados, no dijo la, no usó la palabra desesperados, eh, creo que fue Brian Nichols, de que no le están metiendo suficientes recursos eh, o esfuerzo por parte del gobierno. O sea, fue una crítica muy interesante y creo que acaba, están saliendo varios artículos sobre eso eh, en, eh, en, en los medios en Estados Unidos, que también crea precesión, pre, eh, pre, eh, 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 una percepción de lo que está pasando. ¿no? O el, el New York Times sacó un artículo sobre... Eh, cómo el, el narcotráfico se ha ido desarrollando en México gracias al apoyo del Estado. O sea, pero cuando estaban hablando sobre los 43 muchachos desaparecidos de Ayotzinapa. Entonces, aquí el problema es en ambos lados, porque por una parte hay presiones por parte de la Casa Blanca y Joe Biden para buscando su reelección, de que van a tener que tener un posicionamiento mucho más contundente. Eso va a resultar en que las candidatas, o por lo menos las dos candidatas que hay en este momento, pues les van a exigir una reacción ante esas presiones por parte de estos, de estos candidatos. Yo si fuera eh, asesora, de, de la, yo diría de las, dos, este, de las dos candidatas, es que creo que el enfoque de las campañas, esta es la parte política, ¿sí? el enfoque de las campañas de aquí a junio, el 2 de junio, tiene que ser en cómo México va a tratar de resolver su prioridad, que es la violencia. El problema de la violencia en México forzosamente tiene que ser, este, la, tiene que ser la prioridad política. Perdonen, porque tengo perros. Este, este, eh, pero eh, entonces el, aquí el problema es cómo van a resolver el problema de la, de la política, eh, eh, de, el problema de la violencia. Y el discurso político debería de ser sobre esos objetivos, buscando mejorar la cooperación con Estados Unidos para que Estados Unidos no llegue a ese punto de que tengan que tener legislación especial para tratar el problema del fentanilo. Porque aquí es el tema del fentanilo, que creo que hay que ser muy correctos. Eh, porque quieren que sean, a pesar de que a través de los años han querido llamar a estas organizaciones eh, Terror, como grupos terroristas y tratarlos con grupos terroristas, no pegaba ese argumento porque no, no había la necesidad, había la legislación y las estructuras y la cooperación. Lo que es diferente ahora es que el fentanilo es tan devastador que hay republicanos que están diciendo vamos a declararlo un arma de destrucción masiva. Vamos a... Entonces, aquí creo que la preven, lo que se tiene que prevenir en este proceso, ¿sí? de aquí al año que entra, que no se caiga en la trampa de tratar de resolverlo declarando terroristas y, y declarando que se va a usar las Fuerzas Armadas estadounidenses, que es toda una legislación diferente, son recursos diferentes, son decisiones diferentes. Lo que hay que es tratar de medio, mantenerse en una, en, una, en una ruta de que hay que cooperar, hay que buscar mejorar la cooperación, hay que asegurar que estos grupos del crimen organizado no decidan las elecciones en México, que es creo que el otro problema que preocupa mucho también en Estados Unidos, que 
que, que sean estos grupos que decidan y que vayan a influenciar las, la, a ambas cámaras. Y tercero, esta tarde volver a reestructurar cómo van a ser estos mecanismos de cooperación. Eso es todo lo que se tiene que decir, porque si empiezan a entrar en detalles en Estados Unidos y en México, cómo reaccionar ante estas declaraciones políticas, se van a cometer errores. Hay que ver quién queda en la Casa Blanca, porque va a ser, si queda eh, eh, Trump o un republicano, pues obviamente la política y las decisiones que se van a hacer muy diferentes. Y en México yo creo que... A, Claudia Sheinbaum o, o, o Xochitl, Xochitl Galvez también van a tener que como ve cómo reestructurar su, los aparatos de seguridad eh, nacional de una forma en que se pueda ser mucho más efectivo en poder enfrentar estas organizaciones criminales. Qué rollo me eché, ¿verdad? Buenísima ah. respuesta. Yo, yo creo que te van, a, te, te van a empezar a buscar pronto de ambas campañas, Ana María, porque <risa> David Scheer, tú has seguido mucho estos temas. Eh, eh, ¿Cómo ves la cosa? ¿Qué habría que hacer? Eh, ¿Si ¿sí lo ves como la crisis más profunda? ¿Y, ¿Y tú qué propondrías? ¿Qué le propondrías a México? ¿Y cómo tratarías, digamos, de paliar a los republicanos? Porque me parece que, que la manera de que están hablando de México, eh, los candidatos republicanos, de la manera que Tucker Carlson, el, el gran, digamos, ideólogo republicano, el amigo de Trump, el expresentador de Fox News, la verdad es que cuando yo lo escucho, pues casi me siento amigo de los carteles mexicanos, o sea, parecería que los carteles mexicanos están llegando a darles, la, y, y los obligan a, to, a, 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 a tomar la droga. ¿Cómo ve las cosas, David? Luego pasamos con José. No sé si haya más preguntas, yo, eh, Nathan, por ahí. Si quieres, de una vez, échalas por ahí. Bueno, well, I, I want to say, I, I agree strongly, first of all, with, um, with José, Uh, and, and all the panelists, but particularly on this point, I mean, and I want to say it more bluntly, I mean, why are Republicans freaking out about Mexico? It, it's politics. Um, specifically, it's a politics of grievance and hate. And I, it's from the very first words of his presidential campaign, Donald Trump taught Republicans how to weaponize fear and hatred of Mexico. Um, and as Jose also points out, China, uh, the, the the Republican Party is latching on to an approach to politics, at, at least a significant segment of the Republican Party is latching on to a uh, an approach to politics that's very much dependent on demonizing others. And um, that is that is something that we've seen in the past in the United States. Uh, is something that we see in other countries around the world. I think ultimately it's a it's not a good formula and it is not going to be a successful approach for the Republican Party. I think it's going to be a disaster for the Republican Party. I'm not sure there's much that Mexico or Mexican politicians can do to help the Republican Party help itself. Um, there are many, uh, I think, very able and right-minded Republican politicians who are working to try to counter that narrative. Um, but it's going, it, that's not going to happen in my opinion until after 2024, when the party is forced to reckon with the, uh, the implications of its actions and its, its, its tendencies. Um, uh, presumably, you know, to, if they win, maybe they'll think it's, hey, this is a great strategy, it's working. And uh, I think that would be a, a, an unfortunate result for everyone. But uh, I, I do think that, uh, I have faith in the American public and our ability to discern um, what is right and what is um, it, what is good politics. So I'm 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 hopeful, um, <laughs> and I'm always an optimist because I have kind of a long term view, and I don't pay attention to what Tucker Carlson says on a daily basis. <laughs> But um, you know, I also have low expectations. <laughs> So I, I recognize that, you know, this is not this is not just a Trump era phenomenon. This is something that we've seen going on since the 1980s, this politics of grievance and uh, this fear of undocumented immigrants and this anti-Mexican narrative is something that has been going on even before Trump. So I think we have to be realistic about the way that, um, you know, the, the dog whistles have gotten louder in American politics um, and Uh, that, that is something that we have to reconcile with. I, I think, frankly, what's not helpful, and I, I, I don't want to offend my Mexican friends, but I think it's not helpful when Mexico's leadership 
says things like, we don't, we, there's no fentanyl here. We're not the problem. There are definitely serious issues, serious problems in Mexico, governability problems, security problems that have an impact in the United States, just like our guns and our drug abuse, our, our addiction to drugs has a negative impact on Mexico. We have to recognize that we have shared responsibilities in this uh, relationship. And the United States is not doing enough to recognize its role in the problem. And that is on us. And that's where we have to deal with it. But Mexico, I think the best thing that Mexico can do is say, we hear you, we understand that that tens of thousands of Americans are dying because of drugs and we're gonna take it seriously. That's not the message that this administration, that the Lopez Obrador administration is sending to the United States. The message that Lopez Obrador is sending is, we're not the problem, your problems are your problems, you're gonna to have to deal with them yourself. And um, that's, that's not going to forge a cooperative relationship. Um, and I, I, I know there are good people in the Lopez Obrador administration uh, people who understand this and who are trying to make get that message out and get that message to the president. Um, but if they are not successful, then I think it's going to be necessary to, re to, to think about who should be working with the U.S. government on the part of the Mexican government. And Mexico has a choice coming up in 2024. Um, I think that it could be Morena or it could be the opposition. But but there needs to be a recognition that Mexico needs to address the very real and serious problems that it has with rule of law and, and especially uh, drug, uh, drug trafficking. And it needs to work with the United States. This is not, this is not one country's problem or the others. Um, and if we, all have that, if we all have that approach, I think we will be very, very successful. Thank you, David, for your, I mean, this is very sincere and very honest on your part, and I, 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 I fully agree with your reading of Mexico. I believe the the the, uh, the approach of uh, abrazos, no balazos, uh, has its negative consequences in the U.S., and this is one of them. It, it has annoyed uh, people in the U.S. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, I will say, uh, Yes, uh, suffering in the U.S. And, uh, and and some of them are played with Mexico because of that. Na Nathan, otras preguntas y le damos la palabra a José. Uh, sí, I, gracias. If I can, I just uh, very quickly respond uh, to David's sure. uh, uh, comments, uh, which I I, uh, I I find very very um, uh, on point. Is that yes? There's a there's. A, a sector of the Republican Party that has bought into this na national political narrative uh, of blame placing, and you know, uh, amongst us, it, it's you know, it's it's easy to see blame blame placing is it's easy. Uh, it allows you to to uh, to to avoid uh, the complexities of uh, the types of issues that we're talking about here not least of which is, of course, there wouldn't be a, a fentanyl problem in the United States if the demand wasn't there. So uh, the good news, I would say, is that, as, as David mentioned, there, there are uh, serious members of the Republican Party, uh, members of Congress, who do recognize that, uh, that there is a shared uh, destiny with Mexico. You know, let me just... The, uh, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Congressman uh, Michael McCall from Texas, very, very sober uh, person. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. I find a lot of Republican members who uh, do not buy into this sort of um, facile narrative that is out there that other politicians uh, seek to propagate out on the hustings. Uh, I, I think it's a uh, it's a dead end. It is it is uh, it is something that that uh, is doesn't um, reflect uh, the most honorable uh, aspects of this country, and uh, let's hope that it it uh, it subsides uh, as we head into some uh, you know uh, contentious uh, political seasons in both countries. Um, I, I think that 
in order for those who care about the strong U.S. Mexico bilateral relationship, is we need to double down, in my humble opinion, on the trade relationship and all all that that signifies. I just saw a report that uh, Mexico has now become the um, number one trading partner for the United States. Well, of course, that that has everything to do with the health of the U.S. economy, the health, U.S. jobs, and the other element I wanted to introduce uh, in terms of, of, again, superseding the difficulties of the moment is to keep our eye a focus that, uh, you know, we all know that, that, the, that what the pandemic exposed was the vulnerability of U.S. supply chains, uh, meaning China. And, it, and what, we're, what we're seeing now, of course, is discussions and uh, the indications that Mexico, the role that Mexico can play in uh, stabilizing those supply chains into the future. Now, yes, it's gonna cost a little bit more. It may mean uh, higher prices, but we have to price in right. these national right. security aspects now into our trading relationships. It's not just classical economics anymore, where everything is, is, is geared towards uh, you know, the, the paying the, the, the lowest prices. We have to now uh, accept that these vulnerabilities are real and they have real real life implications for all Americans. And so those that's the future mm -hmm. with U.S. and Mexico is the trading relationship, the deepening. Um, but uh, these other problems, of course, are not going to go away. The violence uh, that's associated with with the fentanyl trade, the drug trade, uh, everything else. But but th there, there's there's bright spots, as I guess is what I'm trying to say, and that all of us who care need to keep keep our focus on that. We can beat back this these these uh, ugly narratives uh, that that some want to uh, propagate uh, for their own economic uh, for their own political benefits in the United States. But it takes as we've been talking, it takes a lot of people of goodwill to keep our eye on the ball. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Nathan, algunas preguntas por ahí. Sí. Está, ya nos claro quedan que nada más 10 minutos. Es que les vamos a pedir a todos que hagan una especie de cierre. Pero adelante con las preguntas, Nathan. Following the shared responsibility concept, existen carteles de drogas en México, por supuesto, pero deben tener una contraparte en Estados Unidos. ¿Por qué nunca se mencionan los carteles de drogas de ese país? Y para terminar otra más, will national politics in relation to such issues can impact the state to state working relations as we see in the California slash Baja California region? Uh, de, eh, de, déjenme hacer una cosa si les parece bien, porque faltan 10 minutos y quisiera que todos habláramos, eh, Nathan. ¿Por qué no empezamos por José? Aparte de contestar estas preguntas, yo les preguntaría, ¿qué tanto esta retórica... Eh, republicana puede escalar. ¿Hasta dónde puede llegar? Y, y, y les pediría una o dos acciones, una o dos, digamos, este, ¿qué podemos hacer para disminuir eso? Para asegurarnos que no escala más y que no se convierte en un problema muy grave bilateral. Porque yo estoy convencido, David, José, y Ana María y Natán, que esto sí puede escarrilar toda esta reubicación de cadenas productivas. Esto sí puede descarrilar. Hay mucho enojo en Estados Unidos. Yo nunca lo había visto así. Tengo muchos años siguiendo la relación bilateral. Estamos pasando a ser piñata política, a ser el enemigo. Eh, es una cosa muy distinta. Entonces, les, les insisto, ¿qué tanto puede escalar? Y por favor, díganos una o dos acciones concretas a tomar eh, para poder evitar esto. Empezamos contigo, José, luego con David y cerramos con Ana María. Y luego le pido a Nathan que haga un comentario final. Adelante, José, por favor. Well, uh, thank you, Rafa. Um, and I, I think that, that um, and this gets back to uh, something Ana Maria was saying a little bit earlier. I think that uh, where we are now is that the, the border uh, situation has hijacked uh, in so many different ways uh, the bilateral relationship. And uh, there is a perception in Washington that uh, the Biden administration uh, is treating President AMLO with kid gloves. Uh, because we need his cooperation on the border so badly. Uh, 
And I think that that is actually redounding to, to the deficit of our bilateral relationship because we can't be honest with each other. And, uh, and I think that we are, we are pulling our punches on some of the, the violence aspects that we could better uh, address together and, and linking up those uh, uh, national security and law enforcement institutions of the two countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 I don't say that we go back to the Calderon period, um, but, but there, I would say that that, was, that appeared to be the heyday of cooperation, cross-border cooperation. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that we have to get uh, back to that, those levels of trust. And it starts at the top. If, if President AMLO is ambivalent, if President Biden doesn't want uh, his, his top officials don't want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, these rather difficult issues of the drug trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, um, then it, that, that has a tendency to permeate the, the bureaucracy. So I, I think that we need to be honest with each other uh, in terms of both presidents and and get to a uh, an agenda that really gets to uh, people's uh, lives at the block level, at the neighborhood level, at the street level, their safety of their neighborhoods. So that's uh, if, if I was king for a day, that's that's what I would. Uh, <laughs> that's what. Thank I you, would. Jose. Thank you very much, David. Sure, please. Your mic. So many things to say in 90 seconds. I will try to be as quick as possible. <laughs> uh, I agree with, with Jose's comments. I'll just also point out in response to Nathan's comment, I mean, we, we actually do talk a lot about organized crime in the United States. There are many well-known gangs. We call them gangs. You can call them cartels if you want to. Uh, these words are meaningless. They're all part of what we call transnational organized crime networks. TCOs, DTOs, OCGs, whatever you want to call them, we have them. They're on this side of the border, uh, and they include groups like the Mexican Mafia. It's not an actual Mexican organization, but it's uh, was formed from Mexican descended people in our incar in our incarcerated population. Uh, we've got the Aryan Brotherhood. We've got gangster disciples. We've got Latin Kings, Crips, Bloods, Mongols, uh, Barrio Barrio Azteca. Uh, you know that we have uh, plenty of. Criminal networks on this side of the border, we're well aware of them. And importantly, we arrest a lot of people involved in, in those networks. And we can document that and we can talk about it as, as evidence of the work that we're doing. Um, and, I, and I think that's, um, there are differences. One of the key differences between tr organized crime groups operating in the United States and organized crime groups operating in Mexico is that the level of protection enjoyed by Mexican organized crime groups is much greater. And we have seen this time and again. They're able to secure uh, protection at the municipal level from uh, mayors and sick public security chiefs. They're able to obtain protection at the state level from governors and from uh, attorneys general. And they're able to get co protection at the national level from police or public security uh, persons like Garcia Luna, uh, and they're able to get protection, unfortunately, from uh, military members. We don't see that level of protection in the United States. It, there are certainly corrupt officials, and there is a problem with corruption uh, in our Border Patrol and in other uh, levels. But you don't have to bribe uh, Mayor Todd Glory of San Diego in order to sell product in the United States. You do need to potentially bribe uh, high level officials on the Mexican side to be able to orchestrate the movement of bo uh, goods across the border and the level of production that we see in Mexico. And so it's, it's just a different a, a different organization of crime south of the border. Um, but we certainly bear some responsibility and we certainly have uh, problems on the US side. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, yeah. But, uh, Thank you, David. Ana Maria. Ana Maria, two minutes, please. Okay, two minutes. So 
two things. One, I'm glad that David brought that up because that's always a question. So where are the drug cartels? Why aren't you arresting people? And I always tell them, go to the second or third page in a newspaper. That's where all, that's where we, that's where you will find the information of how the United States deals with these criminal organizations, which takes me to another step. And it's in reference to David. Said, there is a distrust and we have to talk about the elephant in the room. There is a distrust in terms of how high level protection some of the Mexican government may be giving these organizations. When you have the president of Mexico meeting with the mother of El Chapo Guzman, when you have the president of Mexico kind of interceding and talking about these cartels in the ways that they're people too, and that's why we have to have abrazos y no balazos. And it's right, you know, we, you don't want Mexico to start a dirty war against these criminal organizations, but you do not want the president and his tone in terms of, you know, they are part of society and they have rights to, I mean, the tone that this president has used has created a lot of question marks in terms of, is there, how close of a relationship is Morena or the, you know, or the party or, or this government with different criminal organizations, in particular, when just kind of reviewing the way they deal with these organizations and how the level of violence and disappearances in Mexico have gone up. I mean, and we have to put that on the table. There's just an enormous mistrust in terms of how can you cooperate with a government that is either in cahoots for political reasons or clearly has no interest and it's not a priority. So I think, and that is not gonna get solved between now and, and the end of this administration. I do think that when the new administration comes on both sides of the border, there has to be a redefinition of what the priorities are going to be. Mexico's priority has to be violence. Go after these organizations that produce massive amount of violence and are murdering people right and left. Um, and disappearing people right and left. The United States clearly its priority is gonna be fentanyl. So there has to be a way of finding a way of defining the priorities and trying to figure out how do you dismantle those organizations that are extremely violent and it should be a priority on both sides of the border. In the United States, the rest of that of the, those parts of the organizations that support the trafficking and those who are trafficking um, guns and 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 into in, into Mexico, and maybe we can't call them, you know, they're not terrorist groups, but the impact that they have on Mexico is clearly a national security issue. So maybe there has to be kind of a new classification of these fentanyl organizations that allows both the United States and Mexico to provide kind of a political language or political message that this is a priority and we're going to go after these both organizations. They're not criminal organizations. You can call them subversive. I mean, there's a debate as to how do you call, because they're extremely dangerous. They have territorial control. They have access to weapons. They are transnational in nature and they are very corruptive. So there has to be a new way to call them so both countries can show political um, interest uh, an impact in terms of focusing that part of the relationship on these organizations, which means that at the table, you're going to have all kinds of different uh, discussions in terms of where you get the intelligence, where the resources go, and how you discuss and, and move forward with trying to focus clearly on these organizations only, and particular thank individuals. Thank you, Ana Maria. This is wonderful. Nathan? Gracias. Pues como hemos visto, el fentanilo pues es un problema creciente con una dinámica negativa, donde México, como bien mencionaste, Rafa, pasa de ser una piñata política a ser un enemigo. Esa es un, una tendencia preocupante, sobre todo en la antesala de las elecciones presidenciales en ambos países en 2024. Gracias, Comexi. Gracias, Ana María. Gracias, José. Gracias, David. Uh, you were wonderful. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, uh, your experience, and your wisdom of this, and, and, and for being so honest. Les mando un abrazo a todos. Thank you. Nos vemos el mes que entra a todos. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Adiós.